start recording. Cool. All right. And this is the uh, tablet because I'm going to use the tablet today kind of to go through a few things. All right. So let's maximize this. And that way it's truly maximized. All right. So do we have any questions? Related to this class? No questions? Okay. Yep. In about two weeks or so, this is week nine. So week 11-ish is about you know, when we have the second exam. Um, but you should be probably working on your notes, you know, along with the class. So, you know. All right. Any questions about the homework assignment? First question is, what homework assignment? <laughs> I, I certainly hope that is not the question that you have in mind because, you know, that would, that would not be good. Okay, so I'm just going to bring that screen to, hmm, okay, I need that screen to show up. There we go. All right, so has anyone tried out this program, you know, to generate random Boolean expression for practice? Huh? Yeah, I'll show it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh-huh. It didn't work? No, it did. Oh, okay. Yep. Okay. Great. Okay. So you use it for practice purposes. Great. All right. So I'm going to show again, you know, how to run this thing. So first of all, you go to the announcement and then you download the file. Um, if you just click on it, I think that would download. There we go. Um, and I will download this to my temp folder because I don't need to, you know, keep it around. All right. So now, you know, if you're, this will work even on a Chromebook. In other words, you don't have to have Node installed. You can just run this within, you know, Chrome itself or Firefox or whatever your favorite browser is should work. So the key is to get to uh, the developer, you know, mode which I think F12 on the keyboard would do. So there we go. It doesn't even matter what page you're on, you know, right now, you know, it still works. And then what you do is you go to console, okay? And the only tricky part of, you know, if you were to do this on a Chromebook is how do you get the content, you know, into the console of, you know, this thing here. Um, since I'm not on a Chromebook, you know, I have, you know, my you know, usual uh, terminal. On a Chromebook, you can open up a terminal too. You know, there, there are probably ways to open up a terminal so you can get to the file. All right, so uh, I got too many stuff here, but I can just cat, you know, random bool.js and pipe it to xclip cell clip. This may not work on a Chromebook um, because, you know, I'm not sure how you copy and paste content. Probably just, you know, use your mouse, you know, select the text and then copy and paste it. But this is the way I copy the text of the JavaScript file into the uh, clipboard. And once I have that, I can now paste it into the console. Uh, control V like that, and then press the Enter key. And <clears throat> it generated a little uh, expression down here. Now that one is not particularly challenging, but I can kind of work with that if that is what the class wants. Okay. Do we want to do it this? Do we want to do this? Okay, let's do it. So uh, the problem with this approach is you can only copy and paste it once. Um, if you want to run another expression, you kind of have to work with the file a little bit and know how to you know, make it to generate another statement. It shouldn't be too hard. All right, so I just copied it. And for this part of the lecture, because I can type a lot faster, using a text editor. I'm just going to do it this way. All right, so this is the expression, and I want to turn this into a CNF, a conjunctive normal form. Um, so the best way to do it is really to do it by hand. Okay, you know, I would usually do simplification first, like the double negation can be simplified away. <clears throat> and the way, the way I do this is I just kind of copy 
and paste and then do all the changes that I want here. And I would leave comment for myself, okay, just so that I know what I did in terms of the derivation. So I just say, you know, this is canceled, cancels out. Okay, there we go. So the next thing I usually do is to um, handle the implication. So <clears throat> in this case, the implication is it's in parentheses because the implication operator has the lowest priority of all the operators. So if I want this to be done after, you know, before the or, before this or here, it has to be parenthesized. So the way to do this is you negate the first part of the implication and then or the second part unnegated. In this case, you know, the um, uh, parentheses are also needed because the parentheses, uh, the negation has to be applied to the conjunction and not, not only to R. And that's why, you know, RT has to be parenthesized. All right, so now we have, you know, things expressed only in or, and, and not. Okay, so now I can actually start, you know, working with this. But before we do that, I'm going to use, you know, and say this is the definition of implication. I'm just going to make it as simple as possible. As a side note, you know, so that I can remember what I did in each particular step. So when I need to double check, you know, I can retrace my steps and go like, okay, what did I do over here? All right, so the first thing I'm going to do is to do um, De Morgan's Law, okay? So De Morgan's Law is mandatory, okay? There's no way to get rid of De Morgan's Law because if you have a negation of anything like a conjunction or a disjunction, you have to quote-unquote distribute that negation all the way in until the negation is on variables themselves. So that's why, you know, you can always apply De Morgan's Law. They always have to be done. Okay, so we'll go ahead and do that. And you know, using an editor is really helpful because I don't have to retype everything, which is you know, which kind of makes it uh, exposed to you know human error. So this negation needs to be con uh, distributed in. So I get rid of the outer distribution and to put it inside each item. And then because the original one is a conjunction, now it becomes a disjunction. That's how the Morgan's law works. <clears throat> So I just use DM here to remind myself that I applied the Morgan's law. So at this point, okay, I would do, you know, I would do the uh, association. Okay, so let's take the entire thing, move it down here. Association basically means, you know, the parentheses are not needed anymore <clears throat> because the order of the parentheses, you know, does not matter. So this is one layer of you know, removing the parentheses, and this is another layer of removing parentheses. So we'll just say this is you know, because of the associative law. So now we have a DNF, okay? This is not a CNF, it's a DNF for disjunctive normal form. So I look at this and go like, hmm, you know, what can I do with this? I can simplify a little bit, okay? Because I have two Qs, like one over here, and one over here, Q or Q is just Q, okay? So, yeah, we can just get rid of one of them. <clears throat> but remember what I said, you know, I don't, I don't want to do multiple steps in one line, so I'm just going to do this, okay? Uh, we'll just say Q, and Q or Q is just Q. Okay? Because I, I cannot remember the names of all those rules, <clears throat> so I just need to write it down. All right, so now we have a disjunctive normal form that cannot be simplified any further, which means you know it's time to do distribution. So distribution in this case um, involves, um, so first of all, I'm going to group a, a bunch of stuff first. So I'm going to group um, all the things that are already Q, not R, and not T. I will group all of these things together. And then your PS, your P and S is kind of on the outside. So I'm going to do it this way, and this has to do with, um, this is commutative plus associative. Uh, yeah. So commutative means you can move things around within the OR, and then associative means you, know, you can just put extra parentheses that are not needed, but for visualization, it is helpful to have the parentheses around Q, not R, not T, because of the next step. So now we can do distribution. So re to remind you, there are two distributions. One makes sense to you because of normal algebra. The other one is like, 
really, does it work? Yes, it does work. So there are two distributions. One is when you have something like this, it becomes this. This is the one that you're familiar with because normal algebra has this one as well. The other one is A or B and C, and that becomes A or B and A or C. This one does not make sense to you unless you have practiced your know, Boolean algebra because normal algebra does not have the second you know, rule of distribution, but Boolean algebra does. Are we still doing okay? All right. So which one do you think we're going to apply this time? We want a conjunctive normal form, which means we want a, a, a big conjunction of a bunch of disjunctions. So we are already at this point here. Which distribution, which rule of distribution do you think is applicable here? The first or the second? The second, very good. So in the case of the second, that means the A is this entire thing. That is A. And then we have B being P, and then we have C being S. Is that okay? Does everybody see you know, how to apply that rule? Okay, I will even comment here. <clears throat> I'll try my best to use ASCII text. This whole thing is A. This is the B, and this is the C. Do you see why the second rule of distribution is applicable here? Yes? Okay. So that means I can now apply the distribution. So the whole thing becomes, I'm, I want to uh, do the alphabetical order thing. So that's why I put the P at the beginning here. And then I put the S right between the R and the T. So it becomes Q or not R or S or not T in this case. <clears throat> so this is you know, due to distribution. And I'm done. This is your CNF. We have a conjunction of two disjunctions. And each disjunction only consists of variables, like P, Q are just variables, or the negation of a variable, like not R is the negation of the variable, not T is also the negation of a variable. Are we good so far? All right. So this is a quick warm up, I hope, you know, of you know, where we kind of left things off. And this is also completely relevant to your homework assignment. I mean, your homework assignment is probably not as simple as this one, but you know, the way we apply the rules is going to be about the same. Okay, and also in the same order. You know, I would take care of the implications first because they have to be done, um, and then I'll take care of the Morgan's law because they have to be done, and then what is left is just simplification and distribution. That is usually not very helpful. You know, if, you're, if your end goal is to convert to CNF, you typic typically do not need to use the identity rules. Um, the only identity rules that you can probably make use of would be, uh, well, that's not even identity, but Q or Q is Q is a way of simplification. Um, yeah, but typically you don't add a you know, or, false, or and, true, to the expression because it's typically not very helpful. Mm -hmm. All right. Any other question? No other questions? Okay, we're all good. Excellent. So I am just going to give myself another you know, example like that because I want to show you how we can use resolution in this case. Okay. So we'll keep this one around, okay? So we'll call this one, we'll call this one psi, which is you know, representing everything that is given to us. This is psi. So I'm gonna give myself a phi, and I'm also going to show you how to give yourself a new expression, you know, so that you don't have to rerun the whole thing. Um, so I'm looking into <clears throat> the JavaScript program itself, so I can just kind of rerun you know, a part of it. All right. So let's see. Okay, so there are a few things that you do have to do. Um, there are two functions called that you need to do to make a new expression. Um, 
This one cannot be done yet, okay, because we need to create a tree first. So we have to create a tree first, which is a call to, oh, okay, that's not going to be easy. <laughs> I didn't turn it into a function, unfortunately. I suppose I probably should do a little bit better job, you know, abstracting the program. So from line 27, you cannot rerun line 27 because of the let. So you're going to have to, um, okay, I, I will do my best to kind of show you how what to do here. So what I need to do is to kind of shrink this one and put it up here. All right, so in the prompt, which is a little bit harder for you to see, I wonder if I can change the font size of the console. Does anyone know, can I change the font size of the console? Do, 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 do. Editor, advanced settings, I don't see anything here. All right, so if I cannot do that, I can, you can still see it. I mean, you know, especially if you, you know, replay the recorded, yep. Accessibility at the top. Two taps over. Oh, there we go. All right, so let's see. No, that's that's just checking for accessibility from the perspective of, I'm going to do the usual thing, which is the zoom, control plus, and that works. <laughs> All right, the simplest <laughs> approach usually works, and it, there's no harm in trying that first. Okay, so I am going to display both the console here, I mean, and also the editor here, because you need to reset the tree, so you have to basically reset the tree to be a null tree, so you have to reset it so that the operator is undefined as a member, okay? And then we have to rerun this loop here, which is, I know, you know, uh, so from line 29 to 45. So 29 to 45, and I am going to, okay, let me see if I can remember how to do this. Okay, I'm writing it and piping at the same time to xclip dash cell clip, which means I'm taking those lines and writing to the standard output file, except the standard output file is serving as the standard input to xclip, which is how I can put fix things into my clipboard. And that works. Oof. Okay, beautiful. So go back here, control V, you know, this is the loop. We run the loop itself, okay? So now tree is populated. You can always you know, check whether it's populated or not. Um, I think if, it, if you type tree, it will tell you it's just an object. It doesn't tell you how it is. Um, nope, okay, it's not working because operator is still undefined. Okay, why is it not working? Because parts length is still greater than zero. I have to reinitialize parts, ah, okay. All righty, we have to redo this part without the let. Um, so this is from line 17 to line 25. Okay, it's probably easier for me to read, just kind of copy and paste it again. Okay, I promise you I will turn this into a function so it's easier for you guys to regenerate yet just another one. Now, the easiest way for me to do this, okay, because I've shown you once already, so I guess you know, it's okay to do it on the command line this time. So the other way to do this, if you already have Node installed, is just run it again. <laughs> that's, that's just the other way, you know, which is easier. Okay, so now I have another expression. All right, so we'll work with this one. Okay, control, alt, okay, copy, and back to my editor and paste again. All right, so this is my phi, okay? My phi is this expression. So the idea is if psi is representing everything in the I, in iota, in the set iota, which means you know, those are things that are given to you to be true. In other words, this ex, the original expression of Q or P and S or not, not, R and T implies Q is true, okay? I'm telling you that whole thing, this whole thing here, is true, okay? 
Now, it doesn't tell you anything about the individual variable, but it just tells you this entire expression, weird expression, is true. So that is equivalent to everything in IOTA because it is given to you to be true. This is my proposed theorem. In other words, I'm asking the question, is psi implying phi? That's what I'm trying to ask. Okay. So in normal terms, in mathematical terms, I'm really asking, is phi a theorem of psi? That's what I'm trying to figure out. So before we, do, we can do that, we have to first negate you know, uh, phi because of proof by contradiction. So now we say, okay, so let's work with you know, not phi, which is the negation of the entire thing here. Now, I have no idea, okay? It is probably not a theorem, but I'm going to work with this, okay? So I'm going to negate the original thing like that, and then I will try to turn that into a CNF. So you look at this thing here, look at the level of parentheses, it, look, you know, it, it looks really ugly. That's okay. Work with one thing at a time, okay? You know, that's the thing about algebra is if you try to look at the whole thing and say, okay, how do I work with this? It's just one step at a time, like most other things, one step at a time. So the, as I usually do it, you know, I just you know, do the um, <clears throat> definition of implication first. Okay, so this is the definition of implication. Um, and then I can use associative. Okay, so copy and paste it. And this is why you know, using an editor to do your homework is probably good, you know, because you can copy and paste. Um, so I can now do associative, which is basically just dissolving this pair of parentheses because I don't need that anymore. And then I have to negate the entire thing. So now I have to apply the Morgan's law. Okay, so take this entire thing. <clears throat> and apply the Morgan's law, which means you know, I have to take this negation and distribute it to everything inside the conjunction. So we have this and that. Okay. So let me put here and say this is the Morgan's law. Are we still doing okay? Does everybody understand the, the three steps that I have taken so far? The last step is the hardest one to see because we have, if you don't count this negation here, we have not Q and not R and this whole thing here. So when I use the Morgan's law, I'm distributing this negation on the outside to every component in the inside, but then the conjunction between all the components, there are two conjunctions here, they both are converted into ors. That's the whole point of the Morgan's law, is you distribute the negation, but then you have to change the operator from conjunction to disjunction or the other way around. Are we still doing okay so far with the transformations? Okay, so now I look at this and go like, hmm, I can make this look at least a little bit nicer because you know there's a whole bunch of stuff that is unnecessary. So now I clean it up a little bit, double negation goes away, double negation goes away, and I'm very tempted to do the, uh, the Morgan's Law also because it's on the com entirely different component, but I just go like, nah, okay. And so it's out, okay? So now I can apply the Morgan's Law again because this is a negation applicable to a disjunction. The, all of this, this is a disjunction with four components, okay? So we have a negation of a disjunction, so we can apply the Morgan's Law, okay? So copy and paste again. And then we just say, okay, let's take this negation and distribute it to everything in the inside, I'll change the operator in another step, like so. There we go. And I just say this is the application of the Morgan's Law, and then I clean it up. So I'm not cleaning up while applying the Morgan's Law because I need to know whether I remember to apply the negation to each component or not. So now that I have applied the Morgan's Law, I just go like, okay, double negation goes away. All right. And now I think we can do the association thing, okay? Get rid of the association, get, get rid of the unnecessary pair of parentheses like that. This pair is actually unnecessary too, but you know, it's kind of good to keep it here. Okay, 
All right, so now the question is, what do we do next? Okay, we have, this is a mini CNF on the right-hand side, but then we have Q or R, you know, not being a CNF. So what are we going to do? What are we going to do? Okay, let me let, let me add some unnecessary parentheses and see if you can see a little bit better of which rule we should apply next. So we got this is by itself a you know CNF. This is also a CNF, but then we have an or between them. So what are we what are we gonna do? Okay, do you see a situation like this? Okay, and what do we do? Oops, uh, there we go. In other words, we are just applying distribution again, and this time we expanding a little bit more than last time. Is that okay? All right, so let's go ahead and do this. <clears throat> so, and as I said, you know, it's usually better. You know, I like it better when I'm just copying and pasting. It just works out better for me. So I know that this component is the A component, and I'm going to need it four times. Okay, so copy, paste, paste, paste. There we go. Now we have four of those. And then we just have to say the first one is going to be ended with the T. The second one is ended with the not S, and this is ORD, sorry, ORD with the not P, and the last one is ORD with the not R. Get that out of here, okay. And, you know, if I were you, I would do the alphabetical order thing, you know, just so that, you know, things, it's easier to recognize, you know, the pattern later. So the not P can go to the beginning, there we go, and then we have R or not R. So um, I will do it on the next step, okay? You know, we can simplify this one a little bit here. Uh, let me double check. Did I make any mistakes? No, it looks good to me. All right, okay. So in this case, I just use community flow to make things kind of in the alphabetical order. Um, and I can do one more simplification. So the other simplification that we can make here is we recognize that this is R or not R, which is a true, and then whatever or true is just true, whatever and true is whatever, so we just get rid of that one. Is that okay? So this time I did you know, stack up a bunch of simplification steps and collapse the whole thing, okay? All right, so at this point, I think we have a CNF that cannot be uh, simplified any further. So do we have any questions about these particular steps? All of these are should be helping you with your homework assignment. Yes? I'm not sure what you mean by whichever one is A. Yes. Well, disjunction is commutative, which means the left hand side can swap with the right hand side. So it can, yeah, it, so it doesn't matter whether you, if these two are exchanged like this, then you can apply you know, distribution the same way. It just looks, everything looks kind of flip a little bit. Okay, all right, excellent. Any other questions? No other qu yes, go ahead. Yeah, so there's a bunch of rules that are applied. You know, first of all, you have, um, I cannot even remember, uh, R, okay, R or not R, um, and R or not R becomes true. You know, there's a name for that. Um, and then whatever or true is true, there's a name for that one, and then you end up with just true at the end of the whole conjunction, and then you have whatever and true is just whatever. I'm pretty sure that one is identity. Yeah, 
because a true is the identity of conjunction, just like one is the identity of multiplication in normal algebra. Mm -hmm. So I collapsed like three applications of simplifications into one. <laughs> it's not necessary because you know your job is to turn it into a CNF. So this is a CNF. I mean, you know, this is fine. Okay, it's just that you know I don't want to deal with some extra terms that doesn't need to be there. All right. So now, okay, for your next homework assignment, you have to prove whether you know phi is a theorem of psi or not. In other words, okay, okay, let me get rid of this thing here. Okay, and there we go, and there we go. We don't need that here. Okay, so now the question is, does psi oops, implies phi? That is the question, okay, because I want to know if psi is true, does that automatically mean phi is true? This is basically what theorem proving is about for all of your math classes. It doesn't matter whether it is linear algebra, doesn't matter whether it's your calc one or two or three. This is what mathematical proof is about, okay? You know, I tell you something that is axiomatic. These things are true to begin with. And then I tell you something, it's like, okay, what about this statement over here, which can be true or false? If what I tell you that are true to begin with are true, does that imply you know, this other thing is true as well? That's the question. So proof by contradiction is going to be helpful here because what proof by contradiction is telling us is it says um, if and only if psi implies phi, psi and not phi is false. That is the whole premise of proof by contradiction. If phi is indeed a theorem of, of psi, then, and only then, when you look at the conjunction between psi and the negation of phi, this conjunction has to be, has to be false. Okay, and, that's, and therefore the name of proof by contradiction, which is not the same thing as um, counterexample. Okay, you can prove a theorem is false by counterexample. This is not counterexample. Okay, this is proof by contradiction. All right, so you look at this and go like, mm, so what are we going to do? Well, we have psi in a CNF already, right? Okay. So if I scroll up here, this is the original psi, which is randomly generated, and it turns into a CNF like this, okay? So I'm going to just copy and paste, it, paste this all the way down here, okay? Okay, and I just remind myself, this is my psi. We also have not phi, okay? It is not phi itself, it is the negation of phi, okay? Because this is the negation of phi, which is where we started to convert into a CNF, okay? So you have to remember, you are not converting phi itself into a CNF, you're converting the negation of phi into a CNF. But we do end up with, you know, this thing here, okay? It's not super complicated, it's, uh, you know, about normal. So I remind myself, this is my negation of phi, like so, okay? So now I make a conjunction out of these two. Now each one is a CNF already. Phi is already in CNF, not phi. Psi, excuse me, I might have misspoke. Psi is already in CNF, not phi is also in CNF already. So the conjunction of these two is automatically a CNF, okay? Because you know, if each component is a CNF, the conjunction of those components has to be a CNF as well. Wait, does that make sense to you? Okay, let me say that one more time, that's okay. If I have a bunch of components, each one is already in CNF. It's already a conjunctive normal form. If I make a gigantic conjunction of these conjunctions, would that gigantic conjunction be automatically a CNF? Now, let's take a look here, okay? So we are taking psi, right? You know, which is already in CNF like this, okay? So we will take this, paste it over here, we are looking at not phi, which is also in CNF already, and I'm pasting it here, but I'm putting some space 
two spaces in between, just so that we can tell the first part is psi, the second part is not phi. So the question is, if I were to remove these two spaces, would that be also a CNF? It's longer, but is it still a CNF? The answer is, yep, yep, okay. So we are convinced that this is still a CNF, okay, there we go. So now we are asking this question, okay, this is my way of asking the question, is this false? Because if it is false, that means the original phi is a theorem of the original psi, okay? So we want a conclusion. Remember when we first talked about um, propositional calculus, I said, you know, it's not really easy to work with because you have a haystack that is infinitely large because the number of well-formed formulae that you can create out of a simple system is infinite. Okay, now many of those expressions are totally useless. Like P is one, P and P is one, P and P and P and P is one. I mean, you can infinitely stack those things and it's really just, okay, but everything just boils down to P. But the point is you can have an infinite number of well-formed formulae given that you have certain types of operators and a few you know, symbols or variables. You can have an infinite space of well-formed formulae. And the question is, here's my needle, okay? I want you to label a particular well-formed formula as quote-unquote implied to be true from all the stuff in IOTA. So the question is, how can you make that determination? Especially if phi really is not a theorem. So you spend eternity <laughs> labeling everything and it keeps expanding, okay? You can keep labeling and labeling and labeling, but you still cannot label phi as a statement that is true. When do you stop? The, the answer is you cannot know when to stop because I'm asking you find a haystack, uh, find a needle in a haystack that is infinitely large without telling you whether the needle is actually in the haystack or not. So you simply do not have any conclusion. You just don't know whether the needle is actually in the haystack and you haven't found it, or I tricked you to begin with where there's no needle in the haystack to begin with. You cannot differentiate between those two cases. But in this case, we can terminate. Even if I were to trick you and give you a phi that is really not a theorem, you have to terminate at some point. Okay, so we're gonna work with this. So now we have already in integrated two of the three major components that we have already talked about. The first one is CNF. The whole point of CNF is you can give me any Boolean expression and I'll turn it into a CNF, okay? Which by itself is kind of funny, right? You know, it's kind of interesting. It's like you can give me any expression in any nested structure involving, you know, negation, conjunction, disjunction, implication, which automatically also includes, you know, like, equivalent to and all the other operators, and I can turn that into a CNF. Now, the process is a little bit involved, and that's, that's your homework assignment, but we can do that. Now we also use proof by contradiction, which is the point of, oh, this gigantic conjunction here should be false, okay, if phi is indeed a theorem. But how can we know whether this is false or not, okay? So now we need to use the third component, which is resolution. So let me remind you what resolution is about. So resolution is about if you have some A or B in one conjunction, and then you have not B or C in another conjunction, con another disjunction, excuse me. So you have one disjunction AB, another disjunction not B, C, and then you have a conjunction between these two, I'm going to tell you that this is going to imply A or C. That's resolution. So resolution is the only transformation that we need in this case, which is nice because when, whenever you apply um, resolution, you start with one more variable than what you end up with, which means eventually you boil down to open, close paren with nothing in between, okay? That is false. Why is that false? Because of this. Because you can always, you know, look at it this way. You can say this A 
um, false or A is on one side, not A or false is on the other side. So that becomes, after resolution, it becomes a false or false, which is just false, and that's contradiction. Because once you have A false in a conjunction, the entire conjunction becomes false. So that's the whole idea of applying um, resolution at this point. All right, so let me go ahead and apply resolution. So the way to, that I apply resolution, the easiest way to do it is to label all the statements so it's easier to refer to the, each one. So I'm gonna call this one, oh, okay, there we go. This is number one, this is number two, this is number three, this is number four, this is number five. Okay, so we have five disjunctions. They are all ended together. And the idea is I want to perform resolution until one of two things happens. One is I get to the false, okay? Two is I can apply resolution again, but I'm not getting anything new anymore. It's not possible to give me any new expressions anymore. So if I get to one of these two, I can stop, okay? All right, so let's apply some resolution here and we'll see what we can do. All right, so applying resolution. Let's see, the way I do this is systematic. I look at one and I say, can we resolve with two? The answer is no, you cannot resolve with two. I look at one, I look at the third one and I say, can those two resolve? The answer is yes. Why? What is the connecting variable between one and three that allows resolution to happen? The R is the connection. Because one has a not R, the other one has a R that is not negated. So that means R is our quote unquote connection. T is two, but you cannot do two resolutions at the same time. Okay, I know mo many people are gonna be tempted. It's like, oh, so we can just get rid of R, T both together. The answer is nope, you cannot do that. Okay, and I'll show you why. Okay, because once you apply one resolution, then you go like, oh, so that's what it's gonna become. That's what it's gonna become. Okay, so I will apply that resolution. I'll call this number six, which is going to be not important anymore. It's a trivial thing. So number six is going to be um, one side of one, which is P or Q. We get rid of the R because it's used as the resolution or resolving your variable. And then we still have a not T. These are coming from one. And then from three that are unique to three, we got uh, Q already, and we need to add R, and also T. This is after one, three, you'll resolve. So you look at this and go like, huh, what is that gonna become? So what I want to point you to is there's a T here, there's also a negation of T, they're all, they're both inside a disjunction. So that means this entire thing becomes true. And because this entire true is inside the conjunction, it means you just got something, but it's not particularly useful, okay? But I'm gonna let it stay here, just so that I know that you know, I have already considered the, the resolution between one and three. So that didn't quite work out to be useful. I mean, it, it's a step, okay, but it's not useful. All right, so what else can I resolve? I look at one, I look at four. Can those two resolve? The answer is, yep, they can resolve. So when one and four resolve, I have P or Q or not T on one side, and then on four, we get not S. And we also got R. No, R is the resolving variable, so it disappears. So this means you know, this R should not be there either. So that, that's, my, that's my mistake, my bad. Because the, the variable that we use for resolution does not end up in the result any, anymore. Okay, so when we resolve one and four, this is what we get. And I prefer things to be in alphabetical order, so I'm just gonna do some minor editing, so it becomes that. Do we have any questions? Does everybody understand how resolution is applied? How do we know whether two expressions can be resolved? How do we know what they resolve to? Those are the main questions you know, that you should think about if you're kind of, eh, I, I think I got it. You know, 
great. If not, you should probably ask some questions or at least put down in your notes and go like, I need to revisit this. All right, so this is one and four, and now we can look at one and five. So can one and five resolve? And the answer is yes. But once again, you know, it does not resolve to something particularly useful. So let's go ahead and look at eight, which is the resolution between one and five. So I have a choice here, because if I want to resolve expression one with expression five, I have a choice of using P as the connecting variable or using R as the connecting variable. Which one do you want me to use? P, okay, we'll use P. So that means P does not end up in the actual end result. So you know, from one, we have Q or not R or not T. And then from five, we have Q or R over here. But you can also see how Q is duplicated, okay? So this is a simplification because Q or Q is just Q, so we can get rid of the extra Q. But you can also see how not R and R are both here. So that means this entire thing is just true. So it's not a really useful one, you know, because I cannot, I'm not gonna use it for any further resolution. So I probably should kind of mark these things as not useful. Not useful. So this way I don't consider these to be again in few, you know, in further resolution. Yep, question? So the, the resolution thing is useless if you have a, the, the result of the resolution okay. is not helpful. It's not helpful in any further resolution. So I, you know, it's quote unquote a dead end. I don't have to consider using six or eight in the future to resolve with, with anything else. Yep. All right, so we got one five. Now we can look at one six, okay? So one six is not useful, I just labeled it. So we can look at one seven. So when you look at one seven, do they resolve? So between one and seven, they do not resolve because I cannot find a variable that is not negated in one of them and it is negated on the other one. So one seven does not resolve. Is that okay? Does everybody recognize one seven does do not resolve? One eight, useless, okay? Because I already labeled number eight as not useful. So I'm done with one entirely, okay? I don't have to go back to look at one ever again. Done with that. Does that make sense? Now, this is the systematic way of doing things, which is not necessarily the best way of doing things because a lot of times, especially if the whole thing does resolve to false, you might be able to spot an easier way and a quicker way to get to false. But the systematic way is better if I do not tell you ahead of time that you can get to false. Then you have a much more systematic way to know that I have exhausted everything to, that has to do with one. Now we move on to two, then we move on to three, and so on. So now we look at two and we ask, can it resolve with three? The answer is yes, it can resolve with three and two ways too. So at this point, I'm just gonna look at you know, two, three, not useful, <laughs> because if we have the same scenario where we have two variables that can be used for resolution because we can see not R is in two, R is in three, but we also have not t in two and t is in three. So that means we have two variables that we can use for, that, for this resolution. And whenever you have two variables that can be used for resolution, you end up with something that's useless because you just end up with something that is gonna be true. So it's not gonna be useful. But that means you know, I have already considered two, three. I don't have to worry about that again. Um, then we look into 2, 4. So is 2, 4 resolvable? 2, 4, this is 2, this is 4. So they are resolvable and it's useful because you know, the, res the result, no, nope, it's useless because we have not R in one, R in the other one. We also have S in one and not S in the other one. So once again, we run into the same scenario of having two variables that can be used for resolution. So yes, they would resolve but the result is not useful. Okay. So now we look at two five. So is two and five resolvable? The answer is yes, they are resolvable and it's useful. So we will look at two five and see how they resolve. So two has, uh, the connecting variable is what? Between two and five. 
R and not R. Yep. Mm -hmm. So everything else we keep. So from two, we have Q, we have S, we have not T. And then from five, we have um, Q is already here. Uh, not P is used for, R is used for resolution. So we have not P not accounted for yet. So that would be the result of the resolution between two and five. I'm going to reorder and make the P go, go all the way to the front. But do we have any questions about why two and five can resolve into something that's useful and the result of the resolution? Do we understand how that is done? Okay, we got nods. Any questions? Okay. As you can see, this is an extremely mechanical process. Do we like things that are mechanical? Yes and no. No, because I don't want to do it by hand. <laughs> if it's mechanical. Yes, because I can write a program to do it. Okay? So um, I would just move the not P to be at the beginning, you know, because I like things to be alphabetical. This way, it's easier for me to match up your things. So this one is useful. Um, and then we look at 2, 6. Okay? Is 2 and 6 resolvable? So we look at this is 2 and this is 6. Um, oh, two, 6 is not useful anyway, so forget about 6. 2, 7. Okay, so 2, 7. Are they resolvable? And the answer is yes, they are indeed resolvable because uh, one has the non-negative version of S and the other one has the negative version of S. So 2, 7 is, is resolvable. So I just write down 2, 7 first and then I worry about what they are going to resolve to. Okay? The reason why I do this is because this way I remember, okay, let's copy everything in 2 and then let's copy everything in T and then the, um, the variable that is negated in one but not negated on the other one, get rid of that one. The concatenation is then the result, okay? So that means in a very mechanical way, I can also do this, right? So I can just you know, copy this entire thing, including the variable that I'm going to use for the resolution and then copy the other one, which is number seven. Okay, so copy this one. So this way I don't forget something, right? And then I look at this and go like, okay, which one is going to be my connecting variable? Variable S. So not S is gone and S is gone. So now I can look for some additional simplification. Q is appearing twice, eh, it only has to appear once. Not T is appearing twice, it only has to appear once. And then I want you know, things to be in alphabetical order. So I move the P to the very beginning, get rid of this one in the end. So you can see it is really just mechanical, pro the very mechanical process. All right, so 2.7 is done, 2.8 is not useful, uh, 2.9 is not useful, 2.10 is not useful, uh, 2.11 is not gonna be uh, productive because it is the result of 2.5. No, actually, we need to look at 2.11 too. So let's look at 2.11. This is 2, this is 11, and it, they are not resolvable. Um, and then we look at 2.12 here, which should not be resolvable because of the way we systematically do things, and they are indeed not resolvable. So we are done with 1, we are done with 2. We don't have to look at those two ever again. Okay, so now we move on to 3. So we can see this is an extremely tedious process, okay? Um, so we look at three, four. They are not resolvable. Yep. Question? Oh, you're just stretching. Okay. Um, so we look at the three, four, not resolvable. Three, five, not resolvable. Three, six, we don't want to consider that. Three, seven is resolvable. Okay, so 3, 7. So once again, I just write it down here, and then we copy and paste you know, the entire 3 and the entire 7. Oops. And then the entire 7. T is our connecting variable, so that is gone. And then P is appearing. Uh, I want to move the P to the beginning. 
yeah, so, so that everything is alphabetical. Uh, Q is appearing twice, so that would be the end result of resolving 3 and 7. All right, so 3, 8, not useful. 3, 9, not useful. 3, 10, not useful. 3, 11. Okay, so 3 and 11 are resolvable because of the T. Okay, so we look at this, 3, 11, same thing. So by this point, you should see that, you know, this is a very, very boring process. Once you get it down, it is just kind of mechanical. And if for those of you who want to write programs to do this, you are certainly allowed to do that. The only thing I ask of you is do not share your program with other people. Let me tell you why. If you are the one writing a program to do the homework assignment, but only for yourself, the process of writing that program is helping you to understand the concept because you're basically looking at the process, you're looking at the mechanical process and go like, oh, how do I code it in whatever programming language you want to do, right? So that is studying, which is productive, which I have no problem with. But the moment this program is shared with another person, that other person is not writing this program, did not go through the process to understand you know, what is going on, you know, the logic and the whole thing, and just use the result and it's like, oh, I just need to plug in these things, click that button, and then everything is done for me. That is not helpful to the other person. And that's why I do not recommend people to share that program. Now, if you're the, if you're the one writing the program from scratch and go like, okay, I just don't want to go through the mechanical process to have to do this, fine, not a problem. Do not share that program. That's all, that's the only thing, I, only thing that I ask of you. Of course, you know, there might be some programs like this you know, floating on the internet. I do not know, have not searched for that. <clears throat> All right, so I'm just rearranging things. T is the connecting variable, so it would disappear entirely from this whole thing. Q is appearing twice, only has to be there once. So now we have 14, um, and this is gonna get a little bit longer. <laughs> so now we got to 15, which is uh, between three and 12, okay? So between three and 12, do they resolve? So P, Q, the R can be used. The T can also be used, which means you know, the result is not useful. So 3 and 13 do resolve, but it's not going to be useful. Uh, mm -hmm. Let's look at uh, 3, 14. So 3 and 14, do they resolve? Q, R, nope, they do not resolve. So we are done with 3 entirely. So now, you know, you can now look at 4, 5, you know, do they resolve, and so on. So 4, do you guys want me to finish the whole process? You do? Okay, all right, so let's do that. So we are now moving on to 4. 4 and 5 do not resolve. Uh, 4, 6 do not resolve. Oh, 6 is useless. So we might as well get rid of the ones that are useless. Okay, so I am going to get rid of these. Okay, so we don't have to accidentally look at those and go like, oh, let's, what about these? Okay, so we look at 4, 5 already, 4, 7. 4, 7, do not resolve. 4, 11, do not resolve. 4, 12, resolves because of the R. Okay, so 4, 12 resolves okay so 412 okay this is why i write the numbers first you know, because this way i know where to look <clears throat> and then i just do the copy and paste if you don't like you know, the additional plus you can always put the space here uh this is 12 there we go ah copy okay all right so now we clean it up a little bit um the connecting variable is r in this case so the negation of R is gone, R is gone, and then we want alphabetical order. So P needs to go first. Uh, Q only needs to appear once. I think that's it, okay, between four and 12. Four and 13, okay, so this is four and 13. 
do not resolve. In fact, we can simplify a little bit. Okay, between four and 13, um, you can apply you know, um, a simplification because of absorption. Okay. Do you guys remember absorption? There are two absorb rules of absorption, one for conjunction and one for disjunction. So in this case, you know, they, one can be absorbed by the other one. So the question is, which one can be absorbed? You have an overall conjunction, and then you have individual disjunctions. One of the disjunctions between 4 and 13 is more specific, and the other one is more general, which means if you look at the truth table, one has more rows that are true, and the other one has fewer rows that are true, but they overlap. So which one do you think we can just get rid of? The one that is more general or the one that is more specific? In a conjunction, you can get rid of the one that is more general. Because in a conjunction, you just need the you need to keep the one that is true, but for fewer rows. Does that make sense to you? Okay, so <clears throat> all right, so I'm going to explain that why that rule of absorption works. So let's look at um, just two variables. One is A and one is B. Uh, a, B as two independent variables. This is A uh, or B. Okay, there we go. That should be enough. And then we look at A and A or B. Okay, so this is all we need to set up as a truth table to show that point. Since A and B are independent variables, so that, that means A can be false, can be true, when A is false, B can be false or true. When A is true, B can also be false or true. So now we work with A or B, which is pretty easy, false, and then the other three are all true. Are we doing okay so far with this truth table? So now we look at A and A or B, which means we are looking at the conjunction between the first column and the third column. So you can see how this is just your false, false, true, true. Oops. Does that make sense? Which means, oh, that really is just A. So in the case of a conjunction of disjunctions, you can get rid of the more general term. Is that okay? Does, is that enough proof for those of you who are kind of thinking, what are we talking about? Which one can we get rid of? Why can we get rid of that one? This is why Boolean algebra is easier than regular algebra because you can visualize everything using a truth table. All right, so that means you know 13 is really doesn't need to be here because whatever 13 has is uh, 4 already has already. Because we have Q, we have R, we have not S, so 13 really doesn't have to be here. So you know, when you're doing you know, the homework assignment like this, you can get rid of the terms that are not really needed, you know, just so that you can save some time. So we, I'm just gonna get rid of this one because of absorption. There may be some other ones that can also, we can get rid of because of absorption, like 14, we can get rid of because of absorption because 14 and five are really the same thing, except 14 is more general. So we can use uh, the rule of absorption and also get rid of this one. And then 16 is, can we get rid of 16? So we are looking for something that involves you know, basically the same components, but fewer of them. So we got Q or not S or not T. I don't see it. So we might have to keep 16 around. All right, so we got 412 already, 413 we done we have done already, so now we only have 416. So between 4 and 16, can we resolve? The answer is no, we cannot resolve those. So now we start with 5. So 5, 7, can they resolve? Yes, the P can be used for resolution, and it does produce something that is useful. So we have now 17, which is the resolution between 5 and Seven, and I'm just going to work this out here. You know, five seven is going to be Q or R or not S or not T. Can it be absorbed by something else? You know because you know it's the re 
the repetition of something? The answer is yes. It is basically four. So we can get rid of it. You know, we can use the rule of absorption. But we have to track in our mind that five, seven is already matched. So I'm going to keep it around and just put a note here to be deleted, okay? Because I don't want to delete it now because I need to keep track of which two pairs have been paired up. So after 5, 7, we have 5, 11. Uh, 5, 11 cannot be resolved. 5, 12 can be resolved. Okay, so we have 5, 12. Okay, so 5, 12, can it, is it, does it give us something useful? The answer is no. Okay, not useful, which means I'm going to delete that later. But I will keep them around until I have, I'm done with all the fives, just so that I can track it. So the way I'm tracking it right now means, you know, if I want to go brew myself some coffee right now and then go out and buy something because I run out of creamer and then come back home, get my coffee done, and then finally get back to the homework assignment, I can resume immediately because I know the last two that I have paired up is 5 and 12, which means the next one is 5 and 16. Does that make sense? So I always leave behind a trace like this so I can pick it up later, you know, so that you don't have to do the entire thing in one go. Okay, so now we look at uh, 5 and 16. 5 and 16 can pair up because of the P versus the not P. But does it give us something useful? It does seem like that. Okay, so we'll give it a go. So 5 and 16. All right, so let's see what that's going to look like. Um, P is used for the connection. So we got Q. Uh, one has R. One has not S. And one has not T. There we go. And then the next question is, is it useful? Because you know, can we absorb this into something else? The answer is yes, it can be absorbed by four. So we can say to be deleted. Okay. Yep. Sixteen and seven. Sixteen and seven. Oh, you're correct. They are indeed the same, exactly the same thing. All right, so 16, okay, to be deleted. There we go. Um, 5, 16, 5. Nope, we are done, okay, because 16 is the last one that was not labeled useless or to be deleted. So now we are done with all the fives. Get rid of all the ones that we can delete. We can move on to 6 now. So no, there's no 6, there's 7. 7 and 11 can be paired up, but it's not useful. So we'll just kind of write a note here. Useless. We're almost done. Um, and then we have 7 and 12. They cannot be paired up. And there we go. 7 is done. Okay, so 7 does not produce anything that is useful. So now we are looking at uh, 11 and 12. That's the only thing left. Um, they can indeed be paired up. The question is, do they produce something that's useful? So now we look at 11 and 12. So the product that is, it produces something like this. And the question is, is it something that we have seen already? So we got Q not R, S not T, you know, that's the same as two. So it is not something new. Get rid of that, and we're done. It is conclusive now. Any further resolution will only produce something that is either something we have seen already or something that is not necessary because it's a more general term compared to the things that are already here. So what does that tell us? It's a dead end. Okay? And if it's a, if it's a dead end, I do not get to false. Then what is it? Does that make sense to you? 
that we cannot get to false. Because when you look at 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 7, 11, and 12, they are expressions, but none of these expressions is false itself. So that means you know, depending on the values of P, Q, R, S, T, the conjunction of the things that, are, that we have here can still be true, which means you know, it is not false. Okay, the, the overall uh, CNF is not false. That is conclusive now. Now this is a really good example because I just gave myself an example of this phi is really not a theorem. And using the other approach, you can go all day long <laughs> and not know, should I stop You know, because the tech is tricking me or I just have not found the right path to label phi as a, a statement that is true. With this approach, you hit a dead end. Now, I know it is tedious, okay? But nonetheless, there's a certain amount of time that it will take to get to this dead end. Now, how, what is the um, upper bound of time complexity to get to the dead end? I don't need it to be very tight. I just need an A upper bound. Can someone give me A upper bound of how long it's going to take to get to the dead end? So we'll start with how many expressions like this we can have when you have only five variables. Does, does everybody understand what I'm asking? With five variables, P, Q, R, S, T, how many disjunctions can I make out of either the absence of or the unnegated version or the negated version of each variable? Note how I just counted. Absent, unnegated, or negated. And that applies to each variable. We have five of those. So the question is, how many, not counting things that can be absorbed, how many unique disjunctions can I generate? That's an upper bound. There are three for P three for Q, three for R, and so on. So the only question in your mind should be, am I adding three plus three plus three plus three, or am I multiplying three times three times three times three times three? So how would you answer that question? Let me show you a graphical way to answer that question. And this is why I keep the tablet around. <clears throat> Because this way, if I don't use the whiteboard, then everything is captured by the video. I hope it's still working. Yep. OK. All right. So the way you visualize this is you start with the beginning. And you say, hmm, OK, there are three ways for P to go. There's no P, which I say, you know, false. There's P non-negated. And there's P negated. OK. So there are three ways that P can appear in the disjunction. Is that OK? For each one of these, we look at Q. Q can be absent, Q can be whoops, non-negated, or it can be negated. Same over here. Same over here. I think that should be enough to tell you whether you should be adding or multiplying. Which one is it? Multiplying, right, exactly. So that means with five variables, the absolute upper bound of the number of statements they can generate is three to the power of five, which is a relatively large number if you are to do it by hand. So what is it? Um, it's uh, three times 81, which is three, 241, 43, I think. Does that sound about right to you? Okay. I mean, if you were to do it by hand, that seems like a pretty big number. But if you automate this, it's like nothing, right? So this is the number of expressions, disjunctions that can exist. So even when you go through the whole thing, it's like, but tech, you know, this is going to be, uh, it's going to be square to this because you know you're going through one and try to match it up with everything else. Then you're going through two, match it up with everything else, and so on. Fine. 
put a square here. That is the absolute upper bound of the time complexity of the algorithm. Does it look kind of bad? Yeah, sort of. But it's still better than infinite, right? It's still better than I have no idea when to stop because you know that you will stop at some point. Is that okay? All right, so this is this part of the lecture. I'm not taking road today because I just ran out of time. But this lecture is important in the sense that one, it reconnects you with the concepts that we have talked about before you know, the, the break. Two, it connects all three concepts into the one thing that we wanted to do, which is we want to prove a theorem. We want to find out whether something is a theorem or not. And we combined those three things and got this done. So I'm going to name those three things again because when we are in the thick of looking at the resolution and matching things, you know, it's easy for us not to remember, what are, why are we doing this? Why are we you know, dealing with these you know, little pine needles? So sometimes it's good to kind of take a step back, look at the tree, look at the forest. Okay, So the three things that we talked about is one, see, okay, let me go in the order of reasoning, okay, of logic, why it is good. One is we want to prove theorem, and proof by contradiction is a really nifty thing, nifty way to prove theorems, because it says if you put the everything that is given to you as psi, the theorem that you want to prove as phi, you negate phi first, and then you do a conjunction with everything that is given to be true, that conjunction has to be false if phi is indeed a theorem. That is proof by contradiction. That's one. Two is we got this really cool mechanism called resolution, okay? If you give me n variables to begin with, and I can apply that rule, I end up with n minus one variables, okay? And eventually, I can end up with zero variable. So next time, I will show you an example where it does resolve everything, resolve to false, okay? So we have resolution. But darn it, you know, resolution only works when you have conjunction, two conjunctions and one has one thing that is negated, the other one has the same thing, but not negated. It only applies in that case, which means I wish everything is a this conjunction of disjunctions. That's why we talk about CNF why we talk about converting all Boolean expressions into a CNF, because then we can apply resolution like that, super mechanically, right? That's how the three items, the three concepts connect to get this one thing done. So you might think, oh, that means theorem proving is super easy because you know, we have just shown this. You can actually, I think most of you can write a program to do this in about a week or so, okay? You know, because I can, yeah. Unfortunately, this does not include quantifiers. As it turns out, once you throw in quantifiers, <laughs> things get a lot more difficult. So what this is good for is you look at P as a variable is whether tech is boring or not, okay? You look at Q as boring classes, you know, people tend to sleep in a boring class, and you, and so on and so forth, right? So each variable is representing something that can either be true or false, but is not quantified. You're not talking about every professor at ARC. You're not talking about at least one professor at ARC. So as it turns out, quantifiers throws a wrench into this whole thing. So once you have quantifiers, things don't get, they, they get a lot more complicated. And that's why we have strange programming languages like Prolog that can help us with um, propositional logic. It's also called, I'm trying to remember the term. This is the first sign of you know, dementia, but I don't think I have it yet. Um, propositional logic is called first order logic, okay? Can someone guess what is more complicated than first order logic? Second order, exactly, okay? So second order logic includes quantification. And you know, what we just worked out here, this little nifty scheme, doesn't work anymore. 
So that's why we have you know, special, specialized programming languages to deal with quantified you know, reasoning. And Prolog, if you have not heard, heard of Prolog, this is one of the things that we'll explore. I might change the ordering of the topics because you know, we can kind of follow up this with Prolog so that you can at least get to see what predicate calculus is about. This is propositional calculus, which is um, um, first order logic. Predicate calculus is second order logic, which includes quantification. Um, so we'll, we'll talk about that on Wednesday, okay? And I will let the class decide whether to kind of shift the ordering of the topics a little bit, and we, we can talk about predicate calculus before we talk about, you know, um, counting, which is, you know, the, what are the chances that you can, earn, you, you can win the jackpot of Lotto? Which is also important, I understand that. <laughs> all right, I'll see you all on Wednesday. Mm-hmm. <clears throat>